Michael Cochran is extremely well known, uh, not only here in Springfield, but literally internationally because of his wonderful authorships of many good uh, books that he will tell you about. In fact, I'm so jealous of this one, I tried to get one from him and pay his price, but he informed me some time, maybe years ago, that he was totally sold out of the hardback autographed versions. So just for kicks, I went on eBay this week and found there's one for sale for $350. And uh, geez, you know, I, I love him and I love Chet Atkins, but maybe not that much. Okay. <laughs> Michael has been an entrepreneur, as you've just heard from uh, co-ownership with Aunt Nellie Duns. He's been a wonderful entertainer, a fellow Mizzou grad, and uh, enough said. Plays the blues like crazy, I'm told, and uh, also has a wonderful story to tell. Without any further ado, let me introduce Michael Cochran. Thank you. Is this close enough to me? Okay. Okay. Um, get some stuff out of the way here. I am Michael Cochran. I was born and raised in West Plains, Missouri. I'm a Howell County boy. Yes, sir. Uh, Randall Chowning and I are both Howell County boys. <laughs> I always tried to interest Randall and in having a group that we would call Howell County, spelled H-O-W-L, but he's too stuffy. Um, I graduated from West Plains High School in 1962. I went to Mizzou. And um, following that, I went on a long walkabout that took me to San Francisco, New York City, Memphis, Tangiers, Morocco, <laughs> Gibraltar, Marseille, and the southern coast of Spain. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what I was doing then. <laughs> um, I've written some books, and just for reference, the four books that I've had nationally published are on the table over here. Um, and of equal importance to me, as far as what I've done in my life, was a group I founded in 19, actually we started in 1966, but we didn't become known until 1968. A group called the Sound Farm. I did used to work in radio, so it's okay. <laughs> Uh, and there's some pictures over here and some of the graphics. Also on the table is my very first promotional photograph taken when I was 12 years old with my baritone ukulele, of which I was so very proud. Um, the books are, the first book was Chet Atkins, Me and My Guitars, published in 2001, followed by Les Paul and His Own Words in 2005 followed by Hopalong Cassidy, an American legend, the life and loves of actor William Boyd who brought Hopalong Cassidy to life, and then Don McLean, American troubadour, the songwriter who wrote American Pie and Vincent, and whose life, uh, I'm a year older than Don, that was the fun thing. Working with Don, I was finally older than my subject. A uh, wonderful story, though. Don's story reflects a lot of the stories of people in the room tonight. So, um, something happened to me when I was about 13 years old. <clears throat> I was sitting in the model drugstore in West Plains, Missouri, on a stool at the soda fountain, and it was a traditional old drug store with a soda fountain and it actually had booths in the back with a jukebox. I mean, Archie and Jughead could have hung out there. It was, it was just classic. And I was sitting there minding my own business and there was a, a little AM radio on the back bar. And suddenly out of that radio came a sound like I'd never heard before. 
it was Chet. And in his younger years, Chet was a real gunslinger. He was out to make a mark. And so his early records, were very, a lot of them were very fiery, just loaded with what at the time seemed like impossible stuff. You know, he was doing revolutionary stuff at that time. Now there's thousands of guitar players who have copied him and can do what he did. But at that time, it, it, um, it galvanized me. And I immediately put down the ukulele and got a guitar and started trying to play like Chet. Which, of course, I never could, but in trying, I did develop some, some skills. And at Mizzou, in the early 60s, the folk music, what was called the, the folk revival, or the folk boom, was still going. There were a number of venues where we could play. And because of my, I really wasn't a very good singer then, I'm still not. But I was able to do things on the guitar that nobody else could do, and I got a lot of mileage out of that. I got a lot of gigs because of it. Sitting right up here is Mike Carley, who some of you know. He, he has a high, tit high title in the education world. I forget what it is, Mike. But Mike was there, and he was also a good guitar player, and he was also playing the folk music events on the campus. And we became friends, and we're still friends, and still threatening to get back together and pick. But anyhow, um, in 1960, while I was still in high school, my two brothers and I, who were in college, but they were home on Christmas break, we drove down to Nashville to meet Chet. And we did meet Chet. And he was very gracious and very kind. And that really, that sealed his fate as our lifelong hero. Because he could have said, boys, I'm glad you came down, but I'm sorry, I don't have time to fool with you all right now. I'm recording Jim Reeves or something, you know. But he didn't do that. He stopped what he was doing and talked with us and met us and shook our hands and asked us about ourselves. And uh, of course, one thing that helped was that we were always saying, uh, we're the Cochran brothers from West Plains. And one of RCA's biggest stars at that time in 1960 was Porter Wagoner. And so, and everyone at RCA knew Porter was from West Plains. So when we said that we were from West Plains, I think that, that gave us a little extra entry. That began a friendship with Chet that lasted until his death. He died in 2001. Um, we started working on the book in 1998. Uh, I'm kind of going all over the place here. On the end of the table over here are some issues of a publication called the West Plains Gazette, which was a magazine that I edited about the history of Howell County and West Plains and this little general store communities that were around in the area. And we would send those to Chet, and he really liked them. Um, because the Ozarks were very, very similar to where he grew up in East Tennessee. He grew up in the Clinch Mountain area of East Tennessee on a little 50-acre farm, and they were very poor. So uh, he knew that I could write. He had read my articles, and um, it was my brother Russ who came up with the idea to write a book about Chet's career using his guitars, his various guitars down through the years, as mileposts in his career. And when I heard that Russ was planning to do this, I said, hey, wait a minute. You can't just make this a guitar book. This is going to be about Chet's life, and I'm going to write it. And Russ said, OK, bring it on. So that's how that started. And um, 
it meant that we got to spend a lot of time with Chet, which, you know, there's a picture over here of me with sitting beside Chet in his office in 1963. I was 19. And I'm making a silly face in the picture because <laughs> Chet's kind of looking off to the side and I'm going, Gee! you know, it's like, I'm sitting next to Chet, man. And you know what, as, as well as I got to know him and as many hours as we spent together, I never got over being in awe in his presence. It would kind of make you kind of numb because he was a great man. Yes, he was a great guitar player, but even more than that, he was a great man. In fact, in my introduction to his story in the book, I said, Why so many treasure his guitar playing is a question with which Chet himself has struggled. Other than saying he worked at it harder than anyone else, which I think he did. That's what he told me. He said, I never thought I was the most talented guy, but I, work, I outworked them all. And he did. Uh, Chet is at a loss to explain why his music has been so widely embraced or why he is so loved and admired by many. We don't have the full answer either. But in the process of making this book, we did realize something. Chet is not great because of his music. His music is great because of him. <laughs> still gets me. His music is great because of him. <clears throat> so now let's talk a little bit about Chet. Because as you all know, he did come to Springfield two different times. Chet started at WNOX in Knoxville, got fired, went to WLW in Cincinnati, got fired, went to WPTF in Raleigh, North Carolina, got fired. Usually it was because they were saying his playing was too progressive. He wasn't country enough. He was playing ninth chords and, you know, major thirteenths and stuff. And uh, in 1946, Red Foley was named the new um, MC of the um, Sir Walter Raleigh Tobacco slot on the Grand Ole Opry, which was the Saturday night, one hour, prime time, coast to coast broadcast show. And each Saturday night, Chet would play a one minute guitar solo. He had to, he had to, that's how he learned to make such tight arrangements. He couldn't ramble on for three or four minutes. It was get in and get out, get it done and get out. And then the um, advertising agency, oh, it was Prince Albert. Not Sir Walter Raleigh, Prince Albert Tobacco. I'm sorry. I'm 75 years old now and things are starting. I'm like a watercolor that's been rained on, you know. <laughs> During the interview I did with Randy Stewart that Chris and I did, I referred to Ralph Cox. <laughs> of course, there's Ralph Foster and Lester Cox. As a matter of fact, though, the president of First National Bank in West Plains was named Ralph Cox. He loaned me the money to buy a motorcycle against my parents' wishes, so I'll always remember him. <laughs> but anyway, I'm probably going to do that tonight. You know, the cogs aren't quite as sharp as they used to be. Anyhow, uh, Prince Albert advertising people decided that Chet's one-minute segment in those Saturday night shows needed to be cut. And when they cut it, it hurt his feelings really bad and he quit. And he wound up going back to WNOX where he started and he felt like a failure. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, he was ready to quit. He had actually purchased a set of piano tuning tools. He was tired, I mean, I told you how many times he'd been fired. 
he was just tired. And uh, he was married by then, and he wanted to be able to support his family, so he bought some piano tuning tools and was going to take up the trade. And then he met the Carter sisters. Now, the Carter sisters, that's Mother Maybell was their mother, and then there was June, Anita, and Helen Carter, the sisters. They were very successful, had played all over the country, but their daddy, Ezra Carter, Maybell's husband, who was known as Eck, Eck Carter, he decided, he didn't travel with the girls, but he called all the shots. And he said, it's time to come back and stay close to home for a while. And so Knoxville was close to their family farm. And they were there just working WNOX and playing gigs around the area. And they met Chet. They heard he's playing. There's a wonderful scene in the book where June Carter described. Uh, in, in doing this book, I got to go spend the day with June Carter. At, I didn't see Johnny Cash, but I was sitting in Johnny's chair. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure he was there, <clears throat> but he didn't want to come out. I don't blame him. She told the story of how the Carter family, they all held hands and prayed about Chet. Should we ask him to join us? And the answer was yes, and they did, and he did. And Eck took Chet aside and said, we'll be glad to have you, boy, but just one thing. Leave my girls alone. <laughs> And, you know, that was very wise because, you know, it would have turned into a soap opera otherwise. And he, he heeded that. And, as, and Ezra Carter was a huge influence on Chet. I'll get to that in a moment. So pretty soon, for whatever reason, the Carter sisters came back to Springfield and became staff musicians on KWTO, and Chet was with them. They had a morning show. And I mean, they were, I'm telling you folks, they were like the Beatles on a smaller scale. I mean, they played every small town gym. You know, they played in Gainesville, population 350. Gyms, meeting halls, churches, they played all over the area. And the more they played, the more popular they got. Until finally, the Grand Ole Opry came calling and said, we want you girls, Maybell and you girls, we want you to come down and be on the Opry. And they said, great, because, you know, here's something, a point worth making. Nashville was not yet a recording center. There weren't any recording studios in Nashville in 1949 when this happened. Most of the recording was done in Atlanta or Chicago or New York. So the Carter said, great, let's go. And the Opry people said, there's just one thing. There's too many guitar players in Nashville already. You'll have to leave Chet behind. And Mr. Carter said, uh-uh, ain't going to do it. <laughs> he basically said, if Chet doesn't come with us, we don't come. And so... Uh, they finally agreed. Chet went with the Carters to Nashville and started working for RCA as a producer, started making records for RCA, um, thanks to Cy Simon. Um, but he never forgot what Ezra Carter did for him. And um, he did his best to treat everybody he came in contact with the same way. You hear so many people talk about how many people he helped and what a great man he was. And I think a lot of it came from that example that Ezra Carter set for him. So, let's get to Springfield. Uh, I mean, I, I wrote this, so I'm just going to read it rather than wing it. I was just about to take a job in a Chicago shoe store when I got a call from my old friend Louis Ennis. He told me they were looking for a guitarist at KWTO down in Springfield, Missouri. 
I traveled down to the Ozarks where Springfield is located, and glory be, I got the job. I liked the area. The Ozark Hills reminded me of home. Springfield was about the size of Knoxville, a small city, and although it was only 5,000 watts, KWTO was the dominant station of the region and a part of the Mutual Broadcasting Network, which was a national outfit. There were several good musicians on the staff, Zed Tennis, an accomplished jazz fiddle player, a good bass player, Bob White, and an excellent guitarist, Speedy Haworth. It was a great place to work, and I thought I had a chance to do something there, so I had Leona, that was his wife, come down from Ohio. We rented a little place out near Route 66 and set up housekeeping. That was a blessing for us because not, lo not long after we got settled, our only child, our daughter, Merle, was born. She was born in Springfield, March 10th, 1947. And he, everybody thinks he named her after Merle Travis, but the truth is she was named after Aunt Merle. So, I can't take too much time here. Well, they're going to hook me out of here after an hour. So, um, he's talking here. So, in, they were in, in Springfield in 47. Then they left, and then they came back again. During the, this, I kind of got ahead of myself. They hadn't gone to Nashville yet. During the early summer of 1949, the Carters got an offer from KWTO and we made the move back to Springfield. Homer and Jethro were already there. I don't know if you know this, but Homer Haynes and uh, Jethro Burns were both virtuoso musicians. One on the mandolin, and uh, Homer Haynes was the best rhythm guitar player I've ever heard in my life. I mean, he, he was just, they were great. And when Chet played with them, it was magic. Homer and Jethro were already there, and it was good to reconnect with Cy Simon and the other friends I had there. Once again, we did very well. We played all over the KWTO listening area, drawing huge crowds wherever we, we appeared. I was making $50 a week at KWTO plus getting $50 a night for the personal appearances, which was the most money I had ever made. <laughs> My wife and I liked living in Springfield. We had good friends and I was part of a su successful act. This was the beginning of a good time for me. These were the happiest days of my life right here in Springfield. So, now is when I should have told you about the Opry calling and everything. So they went down, they did go down to Nashville, Chet produced, Chet, something happened. RCA finally put a recording studio in, in Nashville in about 1956. And they asked, they asked Chet, to produce some records for Don Gibson. Don was a talented fellow, but his records just weren't doing anything. So Chet produced a couple of sessions, and they released a record, and on one side was White Silver Sands, and on the other side was Old Lonesome Me, and both songs went to number one. And they were produced by Chet Atkins, and so, they put the saddle on him, if you know what I mean. Let Chet do it from now on. And by the time I met him in 1960, he was producing 30 to 40 artists at the same time. Yeah, it was too much, way too much. So every chance we got, my brothers and I would either go to Nashville or go to, a, if Chet played within a couple of hundred miles of where we were, we would go hear him. 
Um, he actually came to West Plains and recorded a live album with Porter. Uh, came out to our house, played all of our guitars, had a drink of Jack Daniels with my dad. It was, it was wonderful. He was just a good friend. And uh, unfortunately, if you notice, if you look at the books, you're going to notice that the Chet book is not as thick as the other three books. And that's because in 2000, somewhere in 2000, Chet had a stroke. And we lost access to his memory. So I had to make do with what we had. I did get to show him the book, though. By that time, he was staying in a 24-hour care facility. Um, but he, he looked at the book and liked it, and I couldn't have asked for more than that. So moving on. Chet died in April of 2001. And by this time, my brothers and I had been attending the annual Chet Atkins Appreciation Society convention in Nashville, which is the first weekend after the 4th of July. Um, and so we debuted the book there in July after Chet had passed in April. And as you can imagine, it had a huge impact. And that was a very sad convention, but we sold a lot of books. And they were $150 a pop because we only printed, the first run of the book were 1,200 copies signed and numbered. And um, as Robin just told you when he was up here, you can't, we no longer have any to sell, but you'll find them on eBay for 350 bucks because they're a collector's item. Um, but I heard a lot of good old boys say, I never thought I'd see the day I'd pay $150 for no darn book, but it's Chet. <laughs> we did have a policy, if they weren't happy with the book, they could return it for a full refund. And we only had one come back, just one. And that was from a very cagey lady who just wanted to read the book but didn't, own, didn't want to own it. <laughs> and so we honored it. So we sent a copy of the Chet book to Les Paul. We didn't know Les. few days went by and we got a call from Les Paul and he said boy that's some book boy you, you boys really did something and we said hey Les <laughs> how about it would you like to have a book like this about your career he said hell yes <laughs> so we went up to Mawa New Jersey and met him, found our way to his secluded house, knocked on the door, and there he was, the great man. We went in and we sat down. Now, Les was very wary. Um, he'd had a lot of problems with press that he didn't appreciate. So we're sitting there talking, and he said, where are you boys from? Russ said, I'm from West Plains. That didn't make a dent, but I said, I'm from Springfield, Missouri. And Les perked up. He said, Springfield, Missouri, is KWTO still on the air? <laughs> I said, yep, still is. He said, hell, I put that station on the air. <laughs> and it turns out he did. He was like a 17-year-old kid known as Rhubarb Red and he was playing with an older, really good guitar player who went by the name of Sonny Joe Wolverton. And Ralph Foster hired them to come down and play on KWTO the day it went on the air, which was Christmas Day, 1933. 
They called themselves the Ozark Apple Knockers. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, they, weren't, they were here less than a year, but Les had very, very fond memories of, um, of his time in Springfield. Because he was an impressionable kid. He, you know, he was a, still a babe in the woods. Sonny Joe said he had a job for us in Springfield, Missouri. I never heard of the place. He said, I was down in the Ozarks, Mr. Foster is opening a new station down there, and he's offering a lot of work if we'll come down and get it going. Ralph Foster was an important man in the early days of radio in Missouri. He had started KGBX in St. Joe, then moved down to Springfield, and now he was bringing in another station, KWTO. Joe pointed to St. Louis on the map and said, just follow the highway west. I looked and found Springfield about 200 miles to the southwest. Route 66 ran west out of Chicago all the way to California, and I thought, boy, that's the road for me. So Joe, Dolores, and I loaded up Joe's Buick and hit the road to Missouri. Now, there's a lot I could say, but this is, this is one of the better stories Les told me about being in Springfield. <laughs> There's another incident I remember from our time in Springfield. Joe liked to hunt for arrowheads, and it was his hobby. And I would tag along with him just to have something to do. On a Sunday afternoon, we'd go down to the Finley River, close to town, and see what we could find. Now, I had found a girlfriend there in Springfield, a talented little gal who played piano, and we'd been fooling around and thought we were in love. On this particular day, Joe and Dolores, myself and my gal Lou, had driven up to this log cabin where Joe had heard there were artifacts to be bought. So Joe and Dee get out and go up to this country cabin and go in to see what kind of airheads might be there, while Lou and I stay in the back seat. And pretty soon, we're wrestling. <laughs> While this is going on, a man walks past our car and into the cabin and goes straight over to the shotgun hanging on the wall, takes it down and loads it. And he says to Joe, I'm gonna blow that SOB's head off, meaning me. And Joe says, holy Christ, what's Red done now? <laughs> the man was angry because his giggling kids were peeking out the cabin window right down into our car, <laughs> seeing things they probably shouldn't have seen. So he comes out with the shotgun and puts it right up against the window, right by my head, and convincingly makes his point that we'd, be be we'd better be leaving his property in a hurry. Joe and Dee are right behind him. They jump in the car and we head it out. We get it out of there in fast time. And Joe never stopped kidding me about that one. So, so. and the Les Paul book was a big success. Um, I don't, I really don't like to talk about myself or brag, but I, I will mention that Vintage Guitar Magazine, in their review of the Chet book, said it was possibly the best guitar book ever written. <clears throat> and um, the Les Paul book has been called the Holy Grail of Les Paul, of the Les Paul story. So, um, but that's, I can't, I can only take a small bit of credit for that because the fact is these guys had great stories to tell, you know. I was a lucky guy that got to tell them. And it turned out that Hopalong Cassidy, William Boyd, the actor, his widow was still alive. Hoppy died in the 70s. But his wife, Grace, was still alive. She never remarried. I asked her why, and she smiled and said, he was a hard act to follow. And someone showed her the Les Paul book. Some, someone in California had it. She was living in a nice little gated condo uh, in Laguna Beach. And she said, oh, I'd love to have a book like that done about Bill. 
And uh, the fellow that she said that to got a hold of us and uh, mentioned that she had said that. And Russ and I looked at each other and said, why not? You know, another project. So we went to California. We met Grace Boyd, a wonderful, vivacious lady in her 80s, and um, produced the Hopalong Cassidy book. And if any, you know, for anyone who reads the book or who was alive when Hoppy was the biggest thing going, uh, he did. He had a huge impact. It didn't last a real long time. But he had an enormous impact as a moral compass for the whole country. Um, and it turned out then that Don McLean was what we call a hoppy kid. Don was of the impressionable age of mm, six or seven when hoppy was the most famous personality in the world. And the reason for that is television just started to become a big deal around 1949. Uh, I remember we got our TV in 1953 in West Plains. That's when we got our first TV. And Hollywood felt threatened by television. And they, they would not allow any of their films to be shown on TV for the most part. That's why so much of early television was live. But in the process of becoming rich and famous, William Boyd had purchased the masters of all 68 of his film, of his hoppy films. He owned them, lock, stock, and barrel. And when the TV network said they were looking for content, uh, Bill Boyd said, I got some stuff you can use. And they started playing Hopalong Cassidy movies on the early coast to coast networks. And he became the, mo the most famous personality in the world for a short time. Pretty soon, Gene Autry and Roy Rogers changed their tune and started letting their movies be played too. But anyway, Don McLean was a hoppy kid. Um, in the beginning of the Don McLean book, in, in the beginning of the hoppy book, Don wrote a nice foreword for us, and there's a picture of him in his little hoppy outfit. So Chet led to Les, led to Hoppy, led to Don McLean. But it all goes back to Chet. Everything good I did came right out of my relationship with him. So that's the story of the books, and they're there to look at if you want to look at them. Um, I've had a, I've lived in Springfield since 1982. I came here to be music director and do afternoon drive at KGBX. I'd been knocking around in radio for several years before that. And um, the great thing about KGBX in those days was we had a general manager. His name was Alan Thompson, a wonderful guy. Uh, you guys may remember Mother Murs the morning guy we had, and he tagged Alan Thompson with the nickname Cat Gut. And it was those two guys who dreamed up the frozen fish fling, which if, I'm not gonna try to explain this, but if you were around Springfield in, in the mid 80s, you know about it. Um, well, I will explain. Uh, okay. It was a contest. People formed teams all over town. Businesses, charities, they all formed teams, five-person teams with names like the Slimy Slingers and, the, you know. And uh, we, we, we obtained carp, whole carp, and froze them in Smitty's freezer, Smitty's Market's freezer. Of course, we said in the hermetically sealed freezer. So, I mean, it was such a fertile thing to promote. And, uh, uh, and the deal was, all five members would see how far they could throw a frozen carp. And then we would add up the total 
of their, their total yardage. And we had prizes and it just turned, it just caught on. It's just one of those things <laughs> that caught on. And um, I actually, I got, to, I got sent down to, uh, the, there's this organization called BPME, Broadcast Promotion and Marketing Executives. It was a trade uh, thing, trade organization. And they had um, one of their categories, they had an annual convention and they would give awards to radio stations across the country. This is a national thing. And one of their categories was most outrageous radio promotion. We won. <laughs> all markets, all markets, small, medium, large, we beat LA, we beat them all. And so they sent me down there and I got to get up and make a little speech. And the next year, we had another fish fling and we entered and we won again. And then they discontinued the category. <laughs> Uh, but I had great, I have really enjoyed my years in Springfield. Um, my daughter went to school here, Bowerman. What's the other one? Reed, Reed no, no. Boyd. Boyd, Pipkin, Central, class of 1999. Yeah. Um, I've just had a great run here. I have many wonderful friends. I've played a lot of music here with Katie and Randy E. Bright in our, in our little band we call Wild Hair. We miss you. We'll be back. We we'll be back. We'll be back. Um, and right now I'm, doing a, I'm having a lot of fun playing with uh, D. Clinton Thompson, the master of the Telecaster. <laughs> wonderful player. And uh, just, he's become my favorite curmudgeon. And by the way, we'll be at Lindbergh's when, this coming Wednesday night, at Old People's Hour, 6.30. <laughs> so, that's it. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Michael. Uh, I will bring the microphone to you for questions. Also, I want you to know that gal that gave that book back to you, I'll give you $150 for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, were you in on the Bo Durock uh, promotion at KGBX? No, I wasn't, Mike, but that's, that had happened um, just before I came to town. I think um, KGBX was a Statler station, and uh, Statler, a group of local folks, Don Wessel, Tim Loudest, Tim Reynolds, a couple of other folks who had some bucks, pooled their money and bought KGBX and uh, decided they wanted to make it a high profile personality station. So, and I was um, having a great time up in Columbia as Morning Drive on KFRU, which was the dominant station in Columbia then. It was the flagship station for Missouri Tigers football and basketball. I worked for Malin Aldridge, Mike. I don't know if you remember Malin. He called, he called the Tigers play-by-play -play for 26 years. He, he was a wonderful guy. I knew everything about radio and learned. He and I had some great talks. I would get to the radio station at 5.30 in the morning to get, or no, 4.30 in the morning to get ready to go on the air at six and he would always be there with a fresh pot of coffee and we would talk. Anyway, uh, no, I was just after Bo Durock and the pig sticker. That, that was a great promotion too. That was, so Fish Another Fling was just continuing the, the tradition. Another question. Uh, Michael, you've told us uh, something about Chet's guitars and you wrote about Les's guitars. Uh, tell us a little bit about your guitars. What, what guitars have you oh. had and liked? Well, I've got uh, way more guitars than I can play. I have a 1963 uh, Gretsch Country Gentleman that's very dear to me that Chet played. Uh, but I prefer playing acoustic now. In my sound farm days and rock and roll days, I always played an electric. But um, you just, I just, you just don't get the same touch 
on an electric, or at least I can't, as I do on an acoustic. I, my acoustic is a Laravee. L-A-R-R-V-E-E. -E. L-A-R-R-A-V-E-E. -E. Um, Ralph Cox. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, made in Canada, wonderful guitar. Yeah, did uh, Sonny Joe ever get his arrowheads? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they went back to that place. <laughs> Kenny Knauer. Oh, boy. Um, jazz, jazz man. Yes, sir. <laughs> Speaking of the sound farm back yes. in the day in 68 when Sam Thomas and I from Springfield came up to hear y'all play up there. Uh, those are great days and I remember the band great very well. But I want to hear a couple of uh, mentions of uh, Brenda Lee from the old days. Because when I worked at Ozark Jubilee as a back door man and usher, she was there. But when we would go across the street to the Rendezvous Lounge at the Colonial Hotel, to decompress after the show, they wouldn't let her in because she was it's seven. That, she was seven years yeah, old. It, it wasn't. <laughs> it, it wasn't. That she wasn't twenty-one. She wasn't sixteen. I don't believe. But I, um, I don't. Uh, I don't really have any Brenda Lee stories. Uh, but I'm the, aware of what you're talking about because I was seven years old too. Yeah. Watching her on the Jubilee, going, "Dang, man." Oh yeah. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is that uh, Mahaffey and Cy Simon helped us get our jobs there, Terry Meek and I and Bill Meek. And uh, <clears throat> the thing we enjoyed was in the afternoon we worked behind the, stu behind the stage there helping the TV cameras get over the big cables because it would make such a jump in the picture yeah. that you couldn't use it. But uh, the, what we were really doing during the daytime and the afternoon was watching Mr. Foley's stage door, the door to his dressing room. And that was on orders of his wife and the station, which was, if you see Red Foley's door open, you go right to the store and stage manager and tell him not that Mr. Presley has entered the building, but that Mr. Foley has left the building. Yeah. And pandemonium would ensue, and they'd all happen to run to the Pioneer, and the other half would run to the Antler to try to catch it. Yeah. Because if he had one, you could get him to come back and he'd be all right for the evening. But if he had two or more, he could not remember the words of the Lord's Prayer, which was his <laughs> trademark song. Yes, good old Red. And you know, but, uh, the Sound Farm played here, played an outdoor festival gig here in 1969. In fact, I think Chris Albert had something to do with, with getting us down here. And um, I will say we were good. We were good. And we were all original music. And um, we were still just reeling from, uh, it was bad enough that JFK was killed in 63. But then in April of 68, Martin Luther King was killed. And then uh, 30 days later, Robert Kennedy was killed. Bang, bang. I mean, it's kind of like now, you, the way things are now, you just wonder what in the heck is happening here? Um, so we were pretty serious. We, we considered ourselves warriors in a, in a kind of a war that was going on. Uh, I remember when, when Hubert Humphrey ran against Richard Nixon. We, <laughs> We said it was Spike Jones against Elmer Fudd. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we played that show, and there were some boy, young, younger fellows there. Um, Randall Chowning was there, Steve Cash was there, John Dillon was there, and little Donnie Thompson was there. He was 17 years old, and those boys were impressed because we were a group of songwriters, sort of a songwriters co-op, which is exactly what the Daredevils were in their origins, you know. They're not that way now, they're still doing great, but they had the same approach to do original music and do it their own way. So I'm not saying that the Dare Ozark Mountain Daredevils wouldn't exist if they hadn't heard the Sound Farm play, but I am saying that it had an impact on them. It showed them 
what could be done. Mike, is there uh, any personality that you haven't that you haven't um, written a book about that you'd like to write a book about? Mike Carley, I I think I'm done. Uh, it took me basically took 12 years out of my life to write four books, and I'm. Obviously, I have some level of discipline because I got them done and they exist, but I had to get those books done. I had to shut the door and basically just say no to everything that came along. Katie would call, hey, you want to go play some music? No, mm -mm. can't do it, can't do it. Because in writing, you know, you can't lose your sweat, if you know what I mean. Once you get all the plates spinning on the sticks, like on the Ed Sullivan show, remember? You got to keep them spinning. Because if you let it all come to a halt and you lose your sweat, it can take, it can be really difficult to find your way back to where, it's, it's like writing a book is like weaving a rug. You've got all these strands that you got to get in there. And you've got, and your mind is your loom. And so, uh, I have turned down a couple of possible projects that were an honor to have inquiries made. John Fogarty. You know, it's amazing how many people are Chet Atkins fans. That you wouldn't, you know, John Fogarty is a huge Chet fan. And Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Now, these were not sure things, but they wanted to talk. But no, man, I, and now I'm back to enjoying life again. I, um, I remember somebody said, asked Norman Mailer one time, uh, uh, what does it mean that you're gonna be writing another book? And he said, well, it means I won't have any fun for a year. <laughs> okay, Michael, we have one more question. Yeah. Michael, uh, Cowtown Ballroom, the movie and the, 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 the scenario in Kansas City was a big thing, but you were big in the movie as far as talk about it, and you were active there, and it was uh, you and Daredevils and all sorts of people in Kansas City influencing uh, yeah. music. Cowtown Ballroom was a wonderful thing. It only lasted 36 months. It was just a great big for anyone who was never there. It was just a great big empty room. They didn't have seats or anything. You came and sat on the floor or laid on the floor and, and watched the mirrored ball spin around. <laughs> you know? But yes, the sound farm played there a couple of times. And um, yes, they got me in that movie. Um, what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> They, that was an edit, though. They did, that was an edit. But uh, I am, I said some things in that movie that I thought were important. Um, you know, it had to do with the effect of hallucinogens, and everybody kind of snickers about it, you know. But it, it was an important thing that happened. It really was, you know. We were seeking enlightenment. We weren't after kicks. Michael, I have to tell you a story. I was an enormous Hopalong Cassidy fan. Good. And in 1953, I made my mother take me to the Atlanta Coliseum, which was a big enclosed arena. And uh, I stood there for four hours waiting to shake Hoppy's hand and get a little teeny silver medal. Uh, yes. Yeah. The, the Hoppy, yes, I've got one of those little silver coins. There you go. Because yeah. he, he would make tours around the States to do that. And I still have my Hopalong Cassidy chenille blanket. Well, good for you. Can't thank you enough, Michael. Thank you very much okay. for your presentation. Thank you for coming. Please come up and take a look at the things Michael's brought. And uh, have a wonderful ride home. And take whoever you brought with you out to dinner. Be great.